Uh, I see they've turned the volume up this week. Good. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for battling Scepter and resisting Game 7 to come here tonight. Um, my name is Steve Tinney, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Penn Museum. Um, this is our annual series, the Great Series. Most of you are very familiar with it. Uh, this is our Great Beast series this year, in which we will meet many and varied uh, beastly creatures of legend between now and next June. Uh, the next lecture in our series will be on December 7th, when Dr. Jennifer Hauser Wegner of the, our Egyptian section will present on the strong silent type, the Sphinx. Now, uh, before I begin the introduction proper, a note about the program format, which I think most of you are probably already familiar with. Uh, after the introduction, um, there'll be some time, and the speaker's presentation, there'll be some time for a Q&A. And we do ask that you come to one of the microphones that are in the aisles on either side and ask the question from there so that everybody can uh, hear it clearly. Uh, the speaker typically moderates the questions for themselves. And so to tonight's speaker, Dr. Jeremy McInerney. Jeremy is the Davidson Kennedy Professor in the Department of Classical Studies and is the chair of the graduate group in ancient history. He is an expert on Greek language and culture and received his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley in 1992. Jeremy is very widely published and I cannot possibly do justice to his CV in this introduction. But his research interests range from Greek epigraphy to Greek social and political history. In his most recent monograph, Cattle of the Sun, Herding and Sanctuaries in Ancient Greece, he treats his topic from the daily nuts and bolts of cattle herding to the more rarefied questions of cattle in the realm of Greek myth and sacrifice. Uh, I suppose you felt that ancient, uh, the great cows of ancient Greece would not be sufficiently beastly for us tonight, Jeremy. All joking aside, Jeremy's repertoire covers a wide range of topics from the quotidian to the theoretical. He is currently working, for example, on both salt production in ancient Greece and hybridity. Before I conclude, I do want to take the opportunity to extend a special word of, word of thanks to Jeremy and other Penn faculty like him who come here and present in our great series even though they do not have a specific curatorial affiliation with the museum. We really do appreciate the value and importance of having such friends of the museum throughout the Penn community. So thank you, Jeremy. I could say more, of course, but I know that we're all really waiting to hear tonight's presentation, Centaurs, Sirens, and Chimerae, the Greeks and their monsters. And so without further ado, let us give a warm welcome to our speaker, Jeremy. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming out. Um, my understanding is the last game of the World Series starts at 8 o'clock. And since this lecture is only about three hours long, we should be finished by about nine, <laughs> which will give you plenty of time to book an Uber ride back home or to walk or however else you're getting home, because you're not taking Scepter, that's for sure. Uh, I do actually have a lot of stories about Greek cows, so if you want to ask me about those afterwards, feel free. But I'm, <laughs> I, in fact, this, this paper or this lecture originated exactly out of the cattle project when I was invited to a uh, conference in New York. And uh, it was a, it was, the conference was on the theme of animals. And I realized I was in danger of being pegged as the cow guy for the rest of my career. And so I said, I'll come and I'll give a paper, but it's not going to be about cows. It's going to be about hybrids instead. And as I started working on that, I became more and more interested in hybridity and transformation and then more generally monsters in the Greek imagination. And I thought I'd take us on a bit of a tour through some of that material tonight, particularly because it's material that many of us, are, are, we're either familiar with it or we think we're familiar with it. And that might be an interesting distinction. So one of the things I want to do tonight is to raise a series of questions. Whether I'll give any answers or not, I can't guarantee. But um, I want to ask just how familiar are we with the monsters of the, the Greeks? So I'll give you some imagery to look at about that. Then I want to raise some questions about where they actually come from. Uh, 
and some of those answers are literal in the sense of a place and others are more metaphysical in terms of a place in the imagination, which would lead us into a discussion of the significance of hybrids and the theme of transformation, because I think there's something interesting going on in the Greek cultural context of that. And I'm going to suggest a couple of areas. Uh, there is no single unifying theme here. I'll just warn you of that right now. So I'm doing the opposite of what I always tell my undergraduates. You know, I want them to give me a thesis. There ain't no thesis tonight, okay? What I'm gonna suggest is that hybridity, transformation, monsters more generally, are really often bound up in the way that the Greeks think about punishing transgression, the way they worry about the instability of categories in life, and I'll talk more about that, and how they respond to the threat of instability. And what's really, I guess, I'm, I'm, I, I told a fib, I suppose there is an underlying theme, and that is that I think monsters are really about what we are, namely humans. And so I'm going to suggest to you that often the monster is what we see in the mirror, it's the worst part of ourselves, and we'll explore what that might mean. But I do want to also suggest that monsters play an interesting role in the Greek imagination from the point of view of the social life of the Greeks. And I'm going to hopefully surprise you with some examples of what I think are humorous versions of monsters. When we talk about Greek monsters, if you take any of the well-known Greek monsters, such as Kerberos, Cerberus, the Hound of Hell, if you go to Google Image, and this is often a frightening thing to do with any Greek topic, you, you will find literally, literally hundreds, I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of images that will all be somewhat like this. Now, if you're into fantasy art, Boris Vallejo is fantastic, and this is good stuff, and it's typically testosterone-driven, and it's full of these monsters that are gigantic and scary and slavering, and their eyes are red. And the extraordinary thing is that when you go to the Greek material, they're often kind of sweet. I mean, that's a really nice Kerberos. Uh, you see the three-headed monster, except that he looks a little bit like uh, Courage, the Cowardly Dog, the cartoon my kids used to watch. Um, I mean, particularly the one on the left-hand side who's looking back towards the man holding him with a chain, probably Heracles with the lion skin in the club. And he's got this perplexed look on his face. He's actually really not that scary. Similarly, if you go to a character like the Medusa, one of the Gorgons, and I'm showing you a very respectable source because this is from the History Channel, you'll see that this is an aged crone with filed down teeth and snaky coils in her hair. But you'd be surprised it actually doesn't correspond that well to the images that the Greeks themselves entertained. For example, and uh, this is not a good image, but I'll give you a better one in a moment. This is a very famous vessel. It's a proto-attic amphora that's about six feet, seven feet tall in the museum at Eleusis, for any of you that may have been to Greece, from about 650 BC. And it's a famous, uh, famous one because you can't see it in this register, but up above, there's actually a register that shows Odysseus and his men blinding the Cyclops, Polyphemus. It's one of the first depictions of a Homeric scene. But in the body of the vessel, this amphora, you see these figures who are advancing towards Perseus, who you can just see here. And they've got these very strange bodies, these very narrow waists, their legs appearing out of their skirts. They look a bit like Angelina Jolie at the Academy Awards a few years ago. Do you, do you remember when she did that thing of putting a leg out? It was very bizarre. So that's what Angelina Jolie looks like to the Greeks. This is a close-up. And you can see this seems to be modeled on cauldrons that have these protomes, though here they're snakes that are coming out of her shoulders or snakes coming out of her hair. And then you see the row of teeth here snarling at uh, whoever's looking at this. It's a very peculiar image, not exactly scary in a realistic mode at all. And in the course of time, the more images that the Greeks develop of Medusa, um, the less really scary they are. So that, for example, in this Boeotian plate, you can see here's one of the Gorgons, and she's got a few snakes that basically look a little bit like a, a loose belt here and then a few on top, advancing towards Perseus. And then over here is the body. You can see the waist, the torso, and the legs and arms of a second Gorgon, the Medusa, whose head has been chopped off. And from the blood spouting out of her neck comes Pegasus, born of the blood of um, the Gorgon. 
uh, from Selenunte in the 6th century, we've got these extraordinary um, metopes that uh, show here Perseus carefully looking away from the Gorgon. And again, you can see this scary face, and this becomes the, 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 the form that is most widely disseminated of the Gorgon of the Medusa with her scary mouth here. And then you can see her holding Pegasus. There's the horse, and you can just see his wing in there that's born as she's about to die. As we move forward, we'll find versions in which it's very hard to imagine this being a scary image at all. Here's Perseus. Once again, he's looking away so that he doesn't get turned to stone by the Gorgon. But she's basically like a sleeping angel. Completely human form, fairly ordinary face and curly hair, and a few wings here really not entirely that scary. So many of the images of the Greeks don't go nearly as far as we might expect in terms of being scary monsters. They're a little odd, they're a little weird, but they seem to operate in a slightly different register. And of course, Pegasus himself, born of the blood of uh, the Gorgon that's killed, is in fact quite a lovely creature, uh, a winged horse. It's the sort of symbol they used for mobile oil for many years, uh, not scary at all. So the first thing I'm suggesting is we need to adjust some of our understanding of um, what these creatures are like. Where do they come from? Well, it would be silly to suggest that the Greeks invented the idea of monsters or of hybrids. And some of the early depictions of these creatures are ones that really should make us wonder about exactly what's happening when early human communities uh, create creatures that might be at some level scary. This is the, the Löwenmensch, so-called from Holenstein Stadel, uh, and it dates to about 40,000 years before the present. A famous figurine that you can see here is made of bone, carved of bone, with the head of a lion on what is otherwise a human torso. What's its exact significance? Is it meant to scare people? Is it meant to represent a fetish? It's not really clear. But early on in human history, we clearly have a powerful relationship with our animals, as we continue to have to this day. This is Chattelhuyuk, and in the seventh millennium BC, you've got here hunters depicted as hunting or taunting even animals. This one seems to have had its legs cut. And you'll notice that the creature uh, is in fact gigantic by comparison with the scale of the humans here. So there's an argument to be made that as humans really develop consciousness, of themselves as humans, it is partly done in response to the animals that they're encountering. Closer to home, there are other features that I think haven't been really adequately explored in terms of how the Greeks developed their repertoire of monsters. For example, here's the Minotaur. If you've been to the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, you've seen this famous example of the torso of a man, the head of a bull, the horns broken off, but you can clearly see it's the Minotaur. And if you ask, where does the Minotaur come from? I would actually offer a very specific suggestion. And it's that they're from these ritons, these drinking vessels that are used on Minoan Crete in the late Bronze Age. Now, these are vessels that hold a couple of kilos of fluid. Most people would think it's wine. Some people have actually argued it's the blood of bulls that were killed in bull games on Crete. But there is a high degree of sophistication in the way this has been carved out of steatite. This is a portrait. And many of these vessels were then ritually broken and buried as, as if the animal had been sacrificed a second time. Now think for a moment. When the Mycenaean Greeks eventually took over the palaces of Minoan Crete in the 13th century, 14th and 13th century, they were encountering a culture that created these images of bulls. They clearly imagined bulls as being powerful and important creatures that signified the power of royal authority. What better way to demonize your enemy, the people you just conquered, than to turn their object of religious dedication and devotion into a monster? As in fact, all the stories of Minos's family do. In the stories told later by the Greeks, this creature is the result of the impossible lust of Pacify, who, punished by the gods, conceives a lust to mate with a bull, 
has Daedalus construct a frame for her in which this can be accomplished and gives birth to this monster. So these represent exact opposite ends of a spectrum. And I would suggest this is not to do with something deep in the Greek imagination. It's to do with Mycenaean Greeks demonizing Minoan Greeks. Or Minoans, whether they're Greek or not is another issue. And this quickly gets anchored in the consciousness of the Greeks as a staple they return to in their imagery. But it's an interesting image, and I want to emphasize here that the Minotaur, aside from this head, bull-like, is in fact very much like the very man, Theseus, who is attacking him. And so often encoded into the imagery of monsters in Greek myth, in Greek art, is somehow the notion that they're actually are like us. They're not completely different. There's something that almost causes us to reflect on what humanity is, no more so than this really alarming image. A fourth century Apulian plate from about 340 BC that actually has baby Minotaur sitting on the lap of his mother. And that curatrophic position of the mother about to nurse the child is, of course, picked up in the iconography of Isis and Harpocration in the Hellenistic period, and eventually will lead into the iconography of Mary and Jesus. I'll bet when you last saw a depiction of the Madonna, you didn't think about the connection between that and this, namely the Minotaur. So these monsters, in some respects, make us ask, what is it to be a human? The Greeks are also constantly in contact with the East, and this is a point that has to be stressed over and over. Whenever you hear somebody say Greece was the first X, Greece was the first European X, Greece was the first Western X, tell them they're wrong. Greece was the last Eastern X. Greece was the last place connected to the great cultural sphere of the Eastern Mediterranean. And the Greeks are constantly being brought into that cultural zone through the um, objects that are being brought back to Greece, such as this 8th or 7th century griffin-headed deity, which turns up in a Greek context, or this sheet that's imported from the east that shows a sphinx-like creature here. You can see the head, you can see the wings, and you can see the body. And this was found in the excavations at Olympia. So the Greeks are constantly bringing in material from the Eastern Mediterranean. Some of these allow us to follow the lines of transmission of some material and some imagery of monsters. If you look at this Aribolos, on this side over here, it's not very well depicted. I'm going to show you a drawing in two shakes, but just take a look here. You can see an animal creature. There's its head, shoulders, paws, but with a man's head sticking out the center. There's a better depiction of it, and you can see him advancing towards a Greek hoplite who's about to uh, attack him. And John Boardman, 30 years ago, pointed out that this, in fact, is a representation on a Greek vessel, a Corinthian Aribolos, of essentially the same figure found in Carchemish from the 8th century, where, again, you can see the animal body, you can see the animal's face, the claws here, and then you can see the human face on top. Now, this really raises some interesting and finally unanswerable questions. Did the Greek potter who made this see this exact image? Did someone describe it to him? Did he hear a poem where he heard a verbal description and thought, I can actually create that? Those are some questions about transmission of culture. A deeper question about the transmission of culture is, did that mean to a Greek audience what that meant to an Eastern audience? In other words, did the meaning transfer as well as the symbol? That's a very hard question to answer. The Ishtar Gate would have been seen by Greek visitors in the Achaemenid realm. We know there were doctors and there were sculptors and there were ambassadors coming back to Greece from places like Babylon. They would have seen examples like Marduk's dragon, the Mushushu. Would they have known the mythology that goes with that to tell the entire story? When they saw figures like this, 
would they have seen here a creature that made significant meaning to them, or was it simply a weird combination of bull, wings, and man, a lamasu? It's very hard to know exactly what the significance of this was, would have been to the Greeks. But what we can say is that many of the motifs of Near Eastern art get transferred across into Greek art. So here, for example, you see the monster being attacked by the god with thunderbolts, and here you find Zeus, conveniently labelled for us, with a handful of thunderbolts attacking Typhoeus, also known as Typhon. So one answer to the question, where did the Greeks get their monsters from, is they got them from the east, from their prolonged contact with Near Eastern culture. Similarly, here's a centaur-type figure on a Babylonian seal, and here is a Greek centaur of a sh shortly afterwards. So we've got certainly lines of transmission from the east, and we've also got lines of transmission from the past, going back to the Minoan period, giving the Greeks a repertoire of gods. But the great French historian Marc Bloch once said that origin is not explanation. And finally, I think asking where they got these monsters from is less important than asking, what do the hybrids and the transformations that these Greek monsters have tell us about the Greeks and their imagination? So, for example, when you take a look at this image, you can clearly see that there is a man diving into the water and the other men here are being transformed. You can see a human butt, human legs, here and here, but they're being turned into dolphins as they hit the water. Now, in some fortunate cases, we can actually track what the story is that's being shown to us there, because we're fairly certain this is from the Homeric hymn that describes what happens when a bunch of pirates tried to seize the god Dionysus, not recognizing that he was in fact a god. And he swelled up to superhuman size, so that in fact the entire boat there is essentially the size of his couch. And in their terror, the various so uh, sailors who'd been all along the boat here dived into the water where they were transformed into dolphins. So we can see that in some of these stories, transformation is in fact a kind of punishment. There are also other anxieties that, that are being represented by transformation. Here is Heracles, and you can see uh, some of his lion skin here. Here's his big leg there. Here are his arms across here holding Proteus, the old man of the sea, who is undergoing a transformation. In this form, he's actually a sea serpent, but he'll undergo many, many different transformations. And if you remember in the Odyssey, we hear of Odysseus having a similar encounter with the old man of the sea. And he's told beforehand, when you grab hold of him, he will try to change into any number of different shapes. He'll be a lion, he'll be a serpent, he'll be fire. Hang on. Why? Because once you've actually tamed him and he transforms back to his natural shape, he will give you a true prediction of what fate awaits you. In other words, truth is something that is concealed in transformation. And we have to go beyond transformation to get to the truth. So in some respects, the Greeks are playing with the idea that a monster may have all sorts of external forms, but we have to try and puzzle out what lies beneath the skin. Strangely, that's pretty much how we deal with it as well. Because in a lot of schlocky Hollywood movies, the human integument conceals the monster. Interestingly, in many Hollywood movies, what triggers the transformation is sex. These films are largely about anxieties about sex. And in that respect, they're very similar to the Greek stories, which I'm going to expound upon in a moment. Other monsters here also frame our discussion of what it means to be human. If any of you have watched The Walking Dead, the whole reason that you put people into a world of zombies is to pose the question, what is it that fundamentally makes us human? Because if we behave exactly as the zombies do, aren't we zombies? It's a disquisition on the nature of humanity and the social contract. One 
class of uh, vessels in the repertoire of the Greek imagination dealing with monsters has these depictions of sphinxes. But uh, I'd be very interested to hear uh, Jen's talk in December about what the sphinx means to the Egyptians because to the Greeks, the sphinx looks a little bit like a chicken with a woman's head on it. Uh, she's not particularly threatening in a lot of instances. This is one of my absolute favorites, a Boeotian vessel. Um, this is not scary in the sense of really uh, alarming you. It's rather arresting your attention by virtue of its oddity. Now, that's not to say that all the images of monsters are lightweight. There are some that do uh, touch upon themes that we might expect. For example, I'm sorry, this is um, not very good resolution, but this is the monster Scylla described in Homer. And as you can see, it's advertising fairly clearly that it's a human female to about here. And then popping out of the dress is this part which is totally fish-like and monstrous. And it raises a question about the point where the human and the animal intersect. Right there. It's not a coincidence. I'm going to develop that point in a minute. What, uh, what is this particular hybrid about? Well, you all know the story of Odysseus, who was told that the sirens, who again here have the bodies of birds, but their heads and arms of women, sing the most beautiful, seductive song possible. And he wants to hear that, but the problem is that if you hear it, you usually crash a boat on the rocks. So he gets his men to plug their ears so they can sail past, while he himself is strapped to the mast so that he can listen to the song of the sirens. There he is, Odysseus. So that's a good example of a, of a monster that we would recognize. It's the idea of feminine allure turned into something monstrous and non-human. There's another interesting aspect about monsters, or animals in general, but particularly monsters, and that is that they can often be read allegorically. And I put this up not to have a crack at anyone or to suggest I'm going to share my emails with you, because that's not happening, <laughs> but just simply to point out that as part of our cultural DNA deriving from the Greeks, we're hardwired to recognize the notion that animals can stand for something else. Right? I think that's pretty obvious from that. But it raises the question then, when we see this, does that stand for something else? This is the chimera, as promised in the title of the lecture tonight. And there are descriptions of it, going back to Hesiod, that tell us it's a creature that has the body of a lion, it has a tail, which is in fact a serpent, and in the middle of the lion's body, it has the head of a goat. Now that is a good example of a real monster. It is a monster made up of the splicing of the genes of three animals that really don't go together. And it's part of a series of stories that get told involving the hero Bellerophon, who, with his trusty steed Pegasus, attacks and kills the creature. Here you see its lion's head, its goat's head, and its tail with a snake's head at the very end. Now, it's a really interesting question to try and ask, what does that represent, if anything at all? And my larger point is that most often we can't recuperate, we can't find out what these represent. But I'm going to suggest this does represent something very concrete, that it is allegorical in the sense that the elephant is the Republican Party and the donkey is the Democrat Party. Bellerophon and Pegasus are both figures in Corinthian myth. The Corinthians actually minted coins that had Pegasus on them. It's, it's the symbol. You're all familiar with the owls that represent Athena and Athens. Pegasus represents Corinth. Corinthian coins are called Pegasoi. Right? So we've already got a local specific reference right here. What about this side? You might remember that Heracles is involved in destroying a monster, the Nemean lion, the lion of Nemea. And that just south of Nemea is Lerna, which is the home of the Hydra, the snake. And that just northwest of this region is the area of Sicyon, which was known classically in epic times as Agialeia, meaning the land of the goat. I'd like to suggest to you, and I haven't convinced anybody yet, so don't worry if you don't believe me, 
that Corinth is actually encoding its fight, its enmity, its regional conflict with Sikion the goat, Nemea the lion, and Argos, Lerna, the, the hydra, the snake. Oh, posh, you say, that's a ridiculous proposition. Perhaps I can convince you by showing that Sikion actually adopted the chimera as the symbol on its coins. You've got your Corinthian pegasoi, you've got your Sikionian chimeras. Who would have thought that the chimera is not some monster from the deep subconscious? It's a regional conflict between Pennsylvania and New York. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Now, clearly, the monsters and the strange creatures that we've been talking about derive from the very close relationship between humans and animals. And I want to come back to that point because I think it's a terribly important one, particularly as illustrated here in the picture of a ram on the shoulder of this vessel, to whom is tied Odysseus. Here's his head, here's his body, his legs. And it's clearly a depiction of the scene in which Odysseus escapes from the cave of the Cyclops after he's blinded him by grabbing hold of the underneath of the ram. But pretty clearly, there is a sort of sexual element to that depiction. These look like these are two bodies physically intimate and embracing each other. There is something about our closeness with animals that forces us to conceive of creatures that are almost a blend of the two of us. For example, pretty clearly, once you start to have horses ridden by men and there is a close physical union between them, at some level it forces you to think about what happens if you fuse a horse with a man. Now, when I started on this project, I thought this was going to be the most obvious and easy thing to, to, to demonstrate, namely that the centaur is the horseman. That is to say, the cavalry man rendered into myth. In fact, I've been able to find exactly one description that teases out this basic idea. It's in Xenophon. Now, the creature that I've envied most is, I think, the centaur, if such a being ever existed, able to reason with a man's intelligence and to manufacture with his hands what he needed, while he possessed the fleetness and strength of a horse so as to overtake whatever ran before him and to knock down whatever stood in his way. Well, all these advantages I combine in myself by becoming a horseman, a cavalry man, not a centaur, but effectively the same thing. At any rate, I shall be able to take forethought for everything with my human mind. I shall carry my weapons with my hands. I shall pursue with my horse and overthrow my opponent by the rush of my steed. But I shall not be bound fast to him in one growth like the centaurs. Indeed, my state will be better than being grown together in one piece, for in my opinion at least, the centaurs must have had difficulty in making use of many of the good things invented by men. And how could they have enjoyed many of the comforts natural to the horse? But if I learn to ride, I, sh I shall, when I'm on horseback, do everything as the centaur does. But when I dismount, I shall dine and dress myself and sleep like other human beings. So the, the horseman is like a Lego centaur, where you can stick the human torso on or you can take it off. And fairly quickly, the centaur becomes the creature most of all the repertoire of monsters and oddities that excites the imagination of the Greeks. They see themselves as fighting the centaurs, although notice the centaurs are named Petraios, Peter the centaur. That's very sweet. Fighting a Greek hoplite here. And notice how they're, in a sense, comparable with each other. In fact, this comparability almost defines the centaur. Look, if you ignore the line across here, that's essentially a human man fighting a human young man. So the centaur dramatically forces you to imagine an enemy who's partly like yourself. In what ways is he not like yourself? Well, essentially, centaurs represent unbridled lust. Centaurs get drunk at the mere smell of an open bottle of wine. And once they've smelt that wine, they try to rape any woman nearby. That's why they can't be invited to the wedding of the Lapiths, because they smell the wine that the Lapiths are drinking, and they immediately start breaking down the walls. Here's one, and this woman, her head is lost, but you can see one arm here, one arm there, and a hand there, as she physically repels the centaur who's trying to carry her off. Here's another one here fighting with one of the Lapith men. 
And I want you to just think about this for a moment. This is found on the pediment of the Temple of Zeus at Olympia. Now, the last time you went to a church, a synagogue, a mosque, a house of worship, when did you see scenes of rape being shown in the pediment of the temple? And I am talking about rape. I'm talking about women whose clothes are being torn off and who are struggling to resist the creatures that are trying to carry them away. Now, the reason you can do this on a Greek temple is because they're also sending the message that quite literally above all of this is Apollo with his Olympian calm looking out over this scene of rape and murder. So the centaur does represent something about us. The centaur represents the worst thing in a man, an unbridled sexuality unleashed and let loose. And the temple's message is, to be a real man, you must contain that. You have this potential within you. And the story gets even more interesting as you go into the centaurs a little further, because I think most of us are used to the idea of the centaur looking pretty much like this 6th century bronze. In other words, it's a horse all the way up to the horse's neck, which then magically transforms into the waist of a man, and so he has a human half up here. But what is very striking is that there are a number of centaurs in the Greek world that are in fact human from head to foot. Cap a pied. And the horse's half is frankly a horse's ass stuck onto the back. Excuse me, but that's exactly what it is. I mean, you can even see the shape of his human buttocks right there, right? And here's the horse's body attached to that. Now, there's something interesting going on here because if you think about it, these depictions that show centaurs that look like a man and look at the way in which the painting on this Boeotian figurine really highlights that this is a human being, and that's the horse part back there, not to be too graphic, are genitally human. And once it's transformed into a horse, it is genitally equine. Now, that may not strike you as being terribly significant, but if we come back to the fact that the centaurs normally figure in stories of unleashed sexuality, I've got to choose my language here very carefully. In fact, I'm going to apostrophize for a moment. I talked about this to an audience in Athens a couple of years ago, and one of the students listening said to me afterwards, you can't talk about degrees of good or bad in rape, because I had said... The threat of rape was made much worse when that became a horse. And she's absolutely right. But I will stand by the fact that these figurines, at some level, are addressing the fantasy, the anxiety, the concern about one of the most brutal, deviant acts that a human male can do. And by making that male into genitally a horse, they are making it truly horrific. In fact, this project began, I told you about going to New York to give a paper. I wanted to work on hybrids, I said to them, instead of working on cows, because I'd just been to the Argos Museum and seen this guy. He's about a foot tall. He's a centaur. You can see his back legs back there. But I've taken the shot from this angle to emphasize the fact that he is a human male. And in case you didn't get the point, I'll just give you a close up. Now, when I asked my art historian colleagues about this, they all said, well, yeah, it's, it's simple. Centaurs in the Greek world start off as being human all the way to the floor, but then they transform into being horses. But in fact, it's not that simple because the earliest centaur we have in the Greek plastic arts is in fact this one from Left Candy, often identified as Chiron, the tutor of Achilles. And as you can see, he is not a human to his feet, he's a horse to his feet, and he's a human to hear. So for a long period, in the archaic period in particular, say between about 700 and 500 BC, the two kinds of centaurs existed side by side, such as this one here, which again is clearly a human. Centaurs really want us to address the question of what it is that makes us human. And this is brought out, I think, in some particularly strange depictions, like this bronze set of figures up in the Metropolitan Museum, 
where if you look at it from the side, as I've, taken, uh, as I've given you this photograph, you've clearly got a monster, a centaur, and here's a human. But if you look into it as if you are the human looking at the centaur, what you're seeing is just a smaller version of you. You're seeing a human. Because he's human all the way to the floor. You can't see that if you're looking with these eyes from here. There's something very peculiar going on there, just to emphasize the point. What I'm getting at here is that Greek monsters become most monstrous, not when they're scariest, but when they're closest to being human. And again, that's a part of our inheritance from the Greeks, I think. Because the other night I was watching Predator, favorite movie, and I realized you finally think of him as a monster, not when he takes off his mask and he's got crabby stuff going on there, but when you realize he hunts animals, as we do, if you're a carnivore. Predator. And so when the tables are turned and Arnold hunts him, well, is Arnold any better than the predator if he kills another animal? In the Alien series, when you first see the snaky thing popping out of John Hurt's stomach, okay, it's all kind of scary. But the really scary moment is in the second film when you recognize this creature is laying eggs and it is a mother protecting her offspring, leading to Sigourney Weaver's great line, step away from her, you bitch. <laughs> the mammal fighting the reptilian, but it's the same thing, recognizing there the imperative of life and the species. So centaurs, like other monsters, can serve many, many different functions. And I want to resist the idea that there is a single reading for what they are. For example, one of the very interesting areas is going to be in the crossing of boundaries. In the stories of Heracles and um, his wife being uh, kidnapped by the centaur and Nessus and taken across the river, we're crossing a boundary where the hypersexual centaur is about to rape the woman, necessitating the intervention of the super heroic male. And this is something that gets picked up a number of times in a number of depictions. Again, here's Nessus, uh, here's the wife, here's another of the, uh, the centaurs, and Heracles striding in to save her. So at that point, the centaur clearly represents transgression, the breaking of boundaries, the destruction of normal social relations. Fine, but the Greeks do everything in binary oppositions. So if monsters and particularly centaurs represent urgh, the destruction of civilized life, you can also have Pholos sitting down at a symposium with a drinking cup in his hand while he politely shares conversation with Heracles. Oh yes, don't mind if I do, I'll have another cup. This is the symposium. This is the, the basic institution of Greek civilized male life. It's what guys do. We recline at banquet, we discuss Plato, we listen to the flute girl, and we have polite conversation. So ironically, here, the centaur, rather than challenging civilization, exactly confirms it. Now, this idea of the sort of breadth of association gets picked up in astonishing ways for example, here's a mosaic from Tunisia, from a Roman um, villa. And if the symposium represents men being men at their very most civilized, here is Aphrodite, who has performed her toilette, is alluringly mostly naked with some nice jewelry here and uh, some nice garments here. And look who she's being attended by, female centaurs. Did you know there were sexy centaurs? Because that's what these are. And the description of this by philosophers, I haven't put in the Greek for you, but the description is that centaurs have a charm about them because they represent a mixing and a merging of opposites. So just as they cross boundaries and threaten us, they can also actually delight us. And the farthest you can go on the extremity of delight, as opposed to terror, is humor. And so I want to give you an example here of what I regard as a funny centaur scene. This is at the BMA up in Boston. 
It's the marriage of Peleus and Thetis, and there you see him carrying her off, and you see these various girls saying, oh, oh, don't do it, including this girl who is threatening him with a very large fish. More scenes here of girls saying, no, no, don't, you mustn't, and him saying, yes, I will. And looking on at the side is Chiron, right here, the centaur, who remarkably, as you can see from this drawing, is shown with a horse's butt, but is also completely dressed like a Greek gentleman, a kalos kagathos, as the Greeks would call him. And this whole vessel is, in my opinion, meant to be read as a joke because it is quite literally a limp noodle that we see over here in the middle of a scene of rape. Now, I'm sorry, that's not what we would normally consider a suitable subject for humour, but I'm sure that's how this is meant to be read. And in fact, the centaur, as the civilising creature, the exact opposite of the monster who scares the hell out of us, is shown here in a depiction of Chiron. And here he's not just a Greek gentleman, but he's a Greek gentleman who is wooing his young boy beloved. The Erastes with his beard, with the rabbit that he's offering as a love gift, to Achilles, who is a beardless youth, here sitting on his hand. It's actually a joke scene about the relationship between these two reconfigured as if the two of them were in a aristocratic gay couple, the Erastes and the Aromanos, to use the Greek language for it. And in case you think I'm really stretching there, I want to show you a vessel that I came across completely by chance about two years ago in Sicily. I hadn't seen any literature on this and I hadn't seen any pictures of it. I apologize for the quality of it. But here you have a centaur, and he's a horsey centaur. That is to say, he's a horse from the waist down. You can see him with his very equine ears and his very hirsute beard and hair and so forth. And he's gesturing here towards a centaur that is a human centaur. That is to say, he's human from the waist down to his feet as well as above. And this gesture of the holding of the hand like this is a gesture which is repeated in many vessels that show either a man taking a woman in marriage or a, a lover taking his beloved in a seduction scene. The horsey centaur seducing the human centaur. If we could talk about this in question time, I would really like to hear your thoughts because I don't know what the hell is going on in that scene. <laughs> It is very strange. I showed you sexy centaur ladies, and now I'm showing you happy gay horsey centaurs. They work, it seems to me, for a very simple reason. And that is that from at least the fifth century, and probably well before that, Greek culture has given us the notion that the centaur is at some level our opponent, but is also something which we need to tame because at another level, it's us. They continue to delight us, particularly now that, thanks to scientific evidence, we know they really existed. Thank you. That's it. And I think the idea is now we take questions and there's a microphone over there that Anthony has just set up. Is there another one on the other side too? Yeah, there's another one over there. So I think if you would like to ask a question, if you could move to one of the microphones so we can all hear you. Hi yes, please, go Yeah, ahead. so the hybrids are really interesting as monsters. Yep. Um, but a lot of monsters in uh, Greek uh, art and mythology are not actually hybrids. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think about the Aramanthian boar, the Nemean lion, some of the ones you already mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any crossover connection? I mean, the, the, your, your, your choice of categories strikes me as interesting. I, I'm, what about the non-hybrid monsters? They tend to be huge. And uh, the majority of them are, in fact, hybrids. I mean, echidna and creatures like that, the, the, the children of night, are nearly all, at some level, uh, a fusion of different things. 
But the ones that aren't, the ones that are just straight animals of some sort, are usually monstrous versions by virtue of their sheer size. And a lot of those are stories that are about, um, say, uh, they're actually talking about regional problems and putting them into myth form, mm. um, but using the pumped up version of the animal as a way of, of uh, uh, drawing attention to it. Most of the myths involving Heracles, for example, in the Peloponnese, involve things like you know, the birds at the Stymphalian Lake or uh, the Kyrenian Hind. And virtually all of these are creatures that you would actually see in the Greek countryside, but they're just made gigantic, partly so that you can give the hero an opportunity to do something that you and I can't. In other words, to, 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 to kill, tame a creature that is absolutely gigantic and monstrous. But the contrast with the hybrids is that yeah. uh, you, you've got that immediate tie into your humanity that you don't have with the other That's more agrarian true. or bestial monsters. That's absolutely true. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yes, sir. You showed us uh, male and female centaurs. Were there male and female versions of the other monsters? Uh, uh, let me just stop and think because I'm about to instantly say no. <laughs> How did they get more generations of monsters if they didn't? <laughs> In some cases, you kill a monster and more monsters are born from its blood. <laughs> so, you know, there's a kind of parthenogenesis which doesn't apply to the rest of stuff. Um, no, for the most part, the only ones that really are a breed that have, you know, more and more generations of them are the centaurs. So this is why I really do privilege them. I think of them as being somewhat apart from all the others, as, as the gentleman just asked. Um, the really sort of pure monsters, but the really pure monsters tend to uh, crop up just in one story. You know, they'll, they'll turn up with, say, Heracles, um, but the Crinian hind, the Arimanthian boar, the Stymphalian birds, the bull of Marathon, uh, the Nemean lion, they each have just a single iteration, either with Heracles or sometimes with Theseus for the most part. So when you're talking about um, a whole sort of generation or a class or a, a race, um, it's, it's virtually just the centaurs. And then there are these clusters where you'll have three or nine of, say, the sirens or the, the muses. They're, they're obviously not monsters, but it's the same idea, little clusters of these. Thank Good, thank you. To say um, thank you very much for this research. More than anything, I just want to say thank Don't you. Don't thank me for the research, it's too much fun. It's, uh, I mean, I get paid to do this, seriously. Huh? Really, congratulations. <laughs> I'll stop gloating, I'm sorry. Um, you make the topic much more interesting and I find the talk inspiring. Thank you very much. Oh, cheers, thank you. That's the kind of question I love. Would anyone else like to ask a question like <laughs> Thanks. So, so I'm curious, most of the monsters that you spoke of are evil, yeah. okay? Yeah. Uh, but are there any uh, who, are, who are good? I'm, you know, yeah. Are, are, yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Pegasus is the best known example, even though he's born from something monstrous. But notice he's tamed by a hero because Bellerophon rides him. So there's that example. And then um, good monsters. Good well, monsters. Chiron, I guess. Chiron, and um, a colleague pointed out to me uh, a year or so ago that there is, in fact, an elaborate story of how the, the centaurs are created. And Chiron has a parentage which is, in fact, totally separate. So the genealogy of Chiron, even though he is a centaur, is not the same as the rest of the breed of centaurs which I find a very interesting thing. It's almost as if some Greek were thinking of exactly the issue you raised and said, well, hang on, if he's good, how can he be one of them? Well, he kind of isn't, is the answer. Um, the only other one that I would point to is Proteus, the old man of the sea, um, who undergoes many, many different transformations, but is unerring, the merites, he, he tells the truth. And so he's monstrous in form, but not in nature or in predilection or behavior. So, Thank you. Sure. Are there various um, emotions that are connected with specific <coughs> monsters, and are they sometimes mixed? For instance, uh, gluttony maybe with <coughs> Polyphemus and other, others of his ilk, uh, um, courage maybe with lions, lust with centaurs and satyrs. Are any of them um, 
mixed emotion types of creatures? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, generally, not. The centaurs, as you have seen, are certainly associated with lust. But uh, the cyclops, and Polyphemus in particular, are not really associated with gluttony. Uh, the crime he's guilty of, of course, is, is eating men, which is both a form of cannibalism, and eating them raw, which is a marker of being not civilized because he doesn't use uh, fire for cooking the, the meat. So I, um, I don't think there is a, um, a great lead into that Christianizing tradition of thinking about the, um, you know, the seven deadly sins. For the most part, no. And, uh, where does satyrs figure in this uh, cosmology? They're very similar to the centaurs in the sense that they are human-animal combinations, goat and human, uh, and who tend to represent um, lust, but usually in a more comic setting. And so they're often associated then with dancing with girls and getting randy, but it's not really too much of a problem for everyone. So they're, they're like the, 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 the nebbish younger cousins of the centaurs, <laughs> if I can put it that Thank way. You. Thanks. Yes, please. You referenced the fact that, um, that Greek is often referred to as the first or the most foremost. Yes. And then you referenced that just in passing to the fact that it was really the last yeah. um, from the East, yeah. is there something in connection with these beasts and mythological creatures? Oh, absolutely. It would seem to me that uh, I, I'm not a Near Eastern scholar. We should have Steve answering this question. Um, do, you, do you want to say anything about it, Steve? I mean, I know that you know, the Eastern world is full of these symbols of hybrid critters. <laughs> it's all right, go back to sleep. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, in picking up this idea that Greece is really a part of the ancient Near East, but at its western extremity, I, I would certainly argue that many of the models for hybrid creatures and monsters are actually drawn from there. In fact, I'm, I'm not going to let you answer because I cut something out of this paper that I now want to give you, if I can do this, okay? In the Hellenistic period, once Alexander had conquered the East, um, Greek dynasts were in charge of all of the areas that we know of as the ancient Near East, particularly the Seleucids. And uh, the Seleucids control Babylon. In Seleucid Babylon, there is a priest in the third century by the name of Barosus, who, though a priest in the temple of, of Marduk, speaks Greek, reads Greek, and actually writes Greek. So he's, he's one of the first totally bilingual characters that we've got. And in order to make the case to his Greek audience that Babylon really is the oldest and the most venerable culture, he tells a story of a culture hero named Oanes. He's probably Juan, Juan in, in, um, uh, in Babylonian, but he's Oanes in his Greek name. This is a character who walks out of the water every night, out of the Red Sea. And when he comes onto land, he actually has a human body like this, but above and behind his human head is a fish head and a fish skin serving as a cloak all over his body and a fish tail down to his feet. And in the story Barosus tells, he says, this figure, Oanes, taught us everything. And he taught us to write, he taught us civilized living, and then he disappeared. He went back into the water and left. And Barosus says, nothing has been added to the sum of human knowledge since he was here. In other words, he's a civilization hero, a culture hero. But the really fascinating thing is, Barosus then says, and as proof of this, you can see on the walls of the temples of Babylon all of the creatures that existed in his time and up until the present. And they're just like the creatures that I showed you from the Ishtar Gate. So he's actually saying to his Greek audience, you know all those stories you've heard about a creature that's half fish and half man? You know all those stories about a creature that was half bird and half man? You may have thought that was funky Eastern stuff and you guys are above that. Uh-uh. This is the original world from which all civilization arose. And by the way, if you want to know more about it, I'm available Wednesday afternoons 3 to 5. <laughs> As the priest of Marduk. It's a, it's a claim 
to the primacy of the ancient Babylonian culture in the face of a new Greek dynasty. So there's a, a complete interpenetration of these cultures, I would say, originating in the ancient Near East, being transferred to Greece, and then in the Hellenistic period, actually being reinvigorated by the Greeks coming into the ancient Near East and, and literally taking control of it. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, so when you look at monsters like the Minotaur, there's obvious symbols of propaganda against the people of the, against people like Minos. Um, and you could probably say a similar thing for like the Chimera. Yep. Are there any other monsters like that? That have a specific topical, like regional? Like a propaganda type thing. Propaganda type thing. Um, this is going to be a little bit sideways, but a really interesting study done in the last couple of years has looked at all the stories of Heracles and the monsters who he tames. And it's made the point that at every one of the sites that occurs in the Heracles cycle, there is evidence of Mycenaean waterworks, dams, bridges, and um, um, catavothroi, uh, water holes, channels that were kept clear by the Mycenaeans. And um, this scholar, uh, Tina Salloway, has argued that there is, in the archaic period, a recognition, as you literally walk around parts of Greece, that there was stuff there hundreds of years earlier that was really impressive and which we can't explain. And they're turned into stories of Heracles taming a monster. So it's not specifically ideological in the way that you're referring to but it is more broadly an example of using monsters to reconfigure the past and to understand it. In terms of specific regional associations, um, actually it's interesting that with Theseus, for example, it tends to be much more dealing with human uh, monsters rather than animal monsters. So for example, all around the Saronic Gulf, he takes care of criminals who are attacking people, um, Procrustes, who puts people on his bed, and if they're too short, he stretches them out. If they're too long, he chops off their feet. He's tossed off the Scaronian cliffs by uh, Theseus. So the Athenian versions of these stories in the late 6th century are much more about humans, but they are about specific locations, and they are about claiming that the Saronic Gulf is really Athenian territory. I mean, if any of you have been to Greece and you've driven from Athens down to Corinth, those tunnels you go through just past Eleusis are the physical locations that the Greeks associated with these stories of Theseus getting rid of these criminals. So the entire topography of Greece is full of stories about taming that spot, whether you killed a monster or a criminal, but you tamed it, and if the guy who tamed it is your hero, it is fundamentally your territory. That's fascinating. Um, I, I just was thinking about Zeus mm -hmm. and how he um, changes himself into various animals in order to rape humans. Yes. And is there, I mean, I was just thinking about... Um, he does it to gods as well. Right, okay. Because Hera is probably a version of originally a, um, a Mycenaean cattle goddess called Boia which is a great name, Boia. She's um, the, the cow goddess, and so Zeus the bull is to her as the bull is to the cow, just as her name Hera essentially is the female version of the hero. Zeus the hero, Hera the female, the heroine. Zeus the bull, Hera the cow. And if you wonder why in epic she's so often referred to as cow-eyed Hera, Take a look at the other references around it, and you'll find that most times she's cow-eyed Hera, Zeus has figured somewhere within the, the most recent ten lines of the poem. In other parts of the poem where she's just on her own or talking to other gods and Zeus is not around, she's never cow-eyed Hera, she's white-armed Hera. Lucalene. So there's a, an argument, which I'm persuaded of, that there was in fact a period when many of the Greek gods were in fact theriomorphic. They had the form of beasts. Now, I'll just tell you, most scholars don't buy this. Walter Burkett, the greatest historian of Greek religion in the 20th century, said when Hera is called cow-eyed, it's simply because 
pastures and the, and the fecundity of cattle are her special areas of interest. I don't think so. I think at an early level, she's a cow and Zeus is a bull. And I think in the poems, when Homer talks about Athena flitting up into the rafters, we're not to imagine a lady who just um, has a sort of a mist around her and magically appears up there. She's an owl. Yeah. Yeah. She's an owl. So, uh, sorry, I kind of interrupted where you were going with that. No, I mean, that's just exactly what, I just wanted to tie in the, the yeah. gods with this, that's all. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I think the gods are, in fact, theriomorphic. And um, if I can just explore a tiny bit further, the great problem in dealing with Greek religion is that most of us use Homer as our guidebook. And that's a mistake, because the Homeric poems are totally artificial. The dialect of Homeric Greek is not the same as the dialect spoken in any part of Greece. It's just mishmash of all of them. It's as if you were to take Steve's version of English, my version of English, your version of English, and put them together. It's nobody's version of English, right? Just as in Greece, there are different versions of Greek. Um, where was I going with that? <laughs> what language were they in? Uh, they're in Greek, but it's an artificial epic dialect. No, what I was going with was this. Um, Homer describes for us a pantheon that we recognize. It's the pantheon you all learnt in the sixth grade. Right. Zeus has got the thunderbolts, Athena is the goddess of wisdom, Apollo is the god of light, the god of healing, blah, 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 right? But in fact, on the ground in Greece, the gods looked very different. If you read Homer and you look at what Poseidon is like, in Homer, Poseidon is Zeus's dweeby younger brother. He says, I'm really angry with the Trojans because they didn't give me enough sacrifices. Can I tear down their walls? No, you can't. Right? He's a pain. And Hera is a goddess who is incredibly annoying because she's always nagging at her husband. Okay, save Sarpedon if you insist, but don't be surprised if the rest of us save our favourites. She's a nag. But on the ground, in real Greek religion, in terms of the cult that people went to, Poseidon was worshipped all over central Greece. He was worshipped as the god of most of Thessaly, of most of Boeotia, of the federal union of these Greek people. Hera was worshipped on the island of Samos. She was worshipped outside of Argos, at the Argi of Horaeum. She's an incredibly powerful goddess who you fear and respect. Further, if you go into the deep Peloponnese, there's a cult of Athena down past Mantinea, where Pausanias says the statue is of Athena, as we would recognize her, in body, arms and feet, but instead of a human head, she has the head of a horse. So when she's called Athena Hippia, Athena horse, as she's called in many parts of the Greek world, particularly in Athens, I would argue originally at some level, she's a horse. She's a horse. And only later becomes totally, you know, Athena the virgin and the, the warrior. I think I scared everybody off with that, sorry. <laughs> Are we done? Yeah, we're done. Thank you. <laughs>